Um, we've just got a gentleman that's left his phone from a previous, sorry, to embarrass him in front of everyone. Uh, he's left his phone from a previous, uh, from a previous session. He can see it. Um, could you just pass it to him? Hello everyone, thank you, and um, thank you for bearing with us while we, uh, while we sorted that out. I'm Drew Tami, I'm Head of Admissions for the Medical School here in Manchester. Welcome to Manchester, I'm sure you've been to some other talks, so I won't bore you to, de to, uh, to death with, um, with lots of introduction, but uh, welcome. Um, I'm sure there are some people here, so this is one of our quieter open days. It's really nice that we can get everybody in the, um, in the lecture theatre, so I'm sure there'll be quite a number of you here today who are actually quite far on in terms of the process of applying to uh, medical school. So you'll have been thinking about your choices, you'll have your UCAS application almost ready to send, you'll have written lots, you'll have uh, researched your, your choices, and now you'll be, you'll, you'll be down to a handful of medical schools and you'll be picking which ones to actually put on that UCAS form in two weeks' time. And there'll be other people who are way ahead of the game uh, doing their GCSEs and starting their A-levels and um, thinking well ahead about applying to medical school, so welcome, and uh, I'll try and cater to both of those audiences, which would be interesting. I'll talk to you for about half an hour, and then we've got some of our amazing medical students from all sort of diff lots of different years of the programme, actually, um, and uh, lots of different experiences on the programme, and then my colleague Tia will be joining us for a question and answer session uh, towards the end. So I aim to tell you a bit about the programme, um, and how the Manchester programme is different to some of the other programmes out there, and what we think is brilliant about it. And then we'll go on and we'll look at some of the entry requirements, and then we'll talk about interviews and applications, and how to prepare the best possible application, and how to perform really well at interview. And then we'll hand over to our students and to me for lots of, uh, lots of Q&A. They've heard this talk so many times, actually. I thought you'd have come a few minutes later, but there you go, you just, you just love it. Brilliant, anyway. I'll use the keyboard. <laughs> okay, we're different in terms of, I, I, tend to, I tend to wander when I'm lecturing. So this is one of the lecture theatres that we use for first and second year, first and second year students. We have a cohort of uh, just over 400 students in, in total, so this is one of the lecture rooms that you'll be in, and I do tend to do a bit of wandering. So we're different in terms of the structure of our programme, in terms of the educational ethos of our programme. So there's a bit of a misconception out there when you're thinking about choosing a medical school, if you go online, you go to places online and read about different types of medical schools and different medical curricula, you find the traditional programs that are all about lectures and practical classes, and you find the PBL programs that are all about small group learning. Actually, really, in the UK today, none of those programs really exist anymore. Um, you, you can't really find a medical school that has an entirely traditional curriculum, and you can't find a UK medical school that has a purist PBL curriculum. In reality, we're all somewhere along that continuum. And Manchester actually sits pretty much in the middle. We combine, and we think we do it incredibly well, we combine traditional teaching, so we do full body dissection, one of a handful of about five or six medical schools um, that are still using dissection at the core of the curriculum. We have lectures, so you'll have around eight lectures a week. Um, we have a really comprehensive physiology and pharmacology teaching program. We are in laboratories, and you're taught by subject specialists, and you're doing some um, wet laboratory classes, learning some clinical skills, uh, and demonstrating your physiology and pharmacology knowledge. We combine that with small group communication skills teaching, um, 
One of the, the brilliant things about Manchester is that you could be one minute in a lecture theatre with 450 other students, and then the next minute you could be in a PBL or TBL group with 12 students and one tutor, and then the next hour you might be in a clinical skills class where you're in a group of um, three students to one, to one tutor. So we combine both large group teaching and small group teaching really successfully. We combine novel and innovative things um, so we use a PBL, problem-based ethos, along the curriculum. You may have seen if you've looked at our website that we're currently in the process of transforming how we deliver that small group case-based teaching. And um, cases, clinical cases, so doctors work in teams. Doctors work with clinical cases all the time. And the, the, key, the key thing about our curriculum is that each week of the course, you're following a patient through that journey. Okay? You're following a patient from initial presentation through to thinking about physical examinations, what sort of uh, tests and investigations you might want to perform, how what you want to examine, what you want to ask the patient in terms of their history, following that up to get the test results, the examination results, the history, and then following that through to management. So we do this every week as part of the core of the curriculum, you meet a virtual patient. So Mrs. Smith arrives, uh, presents to her GP with some chest pain. And then in your small group, in your team-based learning uh, group, you'll be coming up with differential diagnoses. So you might be saying, well, actually, using the knowledge that we've got already from what we've been taught, from the lectures, from the practical classes, um, from the anatomy, from the clinical skills that we've already done, we could be thinking about what are the potential causes of chest pain. Causes of chest pain, ladies and gentlemen. What might they be? Somebody just said heart attack over there, brilliant. So it might be MI, might be heart attack, might be something cardiovascular. Anything else? Angina, yes, and again, cardiovascular, so MI, angina, brilliant. I think I heard somebody say that they've just pulled a muscle in their, um, in their chest. It could be something musculoskeletal. It could actually be something, it could be dyspepsia, or it could be that Mrs. Smith has a bit of indigestion. Um, so our students will come up with these concepts um, and um, through, they'll be guided by their tutors, they'll be guided by some questions and some answers um, as part of that team-based learning process. And they will refine those differentials and say, well, actually, what makes that more likely? What makes that less likely to be due to indigestion? What makes it more likely to be a cardiovascular cause? And they'll use their anatomical knowledge, they'll use their physiological knowledge um, to follow that patient through their journey through to management and follow up and you see the full, you see the full story. So we're transitioning from problem-based learning, um, which is where you have a small group of students and one tutor, so about 12 students and one tutor, into a slightly more structured format. <coughs> Um, which is called team-based learning, which involves um, answering questions about cases, discussing cases. It's very, very similar. Um, it's just PBL with some additional scaffolding that goes on top of that PBL-centered curriculum. But the core thing um, in the Manchester curriculum is that the case hang each week. You're learning, whether it be your lectures, whether it be practical classes, whether it be clinical skills, all hangs on a specific case, a patient, a virtual patient that you meet. So you'll have lectures about them. Say, for example, if it was that chest pain case and it turned out that it was a heart attack, an MI, um, in your clinical skills class in that week, your communication skills class, you might be learning how to take structured cardiovascular history from a patient. In physiology and pharmacology uh, laboratory classes, you might be learning how to record an ECG, an electrocardiogram, from a patient. Um, in one of your lectures, you might be learning about the various drugs that are used to treat patients with angina, for example, or patients that had an MI. Okay. Um, we use a theme of, you'll see in a, in a second, actually, a structure of the, uh, the programme. Um, we rely on clinical immersion, so from year three of the programme, you're based out at a clinical education campus. That's a mini medical school hospital site. Um, we've got Preston up in the north of the region. We've got MFT, uh, which has got an Oxford Road site, which is just down the road here, Withenshaw site, which is out near the airport, and then last but not least is Salford Royal, which is in Salford. So from year three, you're based out of the clinical education campus of the hospital site, and you rotate around the different district general hospitals and the community placements, general practice, community mental health, all those sorts of services in years three, four, and five. In year one and two of the program, we've got what we call early clinical experience. And early clinical experience is your opportunity to 
visit GP practices and to have hospital placements uh, in the earlier years of the program. So although you're mainly based on campus in the first two years of the course, we've recently expanded the amount of time that you spend in early clinical experience. And even before the start of the pandemic, um, Manchester Medical School was recognised, were actually recognised by Apple um, as a centre for excellence in technology enhanced learning. Um, our students have iPads, and this isn't an advert for, for Apple or iPads. Uh, in year three of the programme, um, our students have an iPad that they use to get various different things signed off. So get your placements signed off, get your practical skills signed off, uh, histories that you've taken um, signed off on placement, which saves you carrying lots and lots of bits of paper around, uh, but it's also very, very efficient and lets us deliver some teaching to you um, virtually. So we've always been very, very good at, um, at technology enhanced learning. And one of the things that um, graduates always say about the curriculum at Manchester is that they feel very, very prepared for practice for their first jobs as a junior doctor after graduation. So in a few slides time, I'll talk through the structure of the program, but that really defines our curriculum ethos. We're a mixed methods curriculum, and we use elements of the traditional and elements of our kind of new medical education theory. We use group sizes that vary from large lectures through to very, very small consultation skills uh, teaching groups. So here's the Stockford building. I'm sure some of you have been on Stockford building tours today. It's the spiritual home of the medical school. It's where um, we do a lot of our clinical skills teaching, communication skills teaching. It's where most of the staff that teach uh, on the program are based. And one of the things about our size as a medical school and, and as a faculty, a broader faculty of biology, medicine and health, is that um, we have so many academic staff and clinicians who teach on the program that if we need to give you a lecture or we need to give you some teaching on um, quite a niche area of medicine, we can always find a world leading subject expert because of the size um, of the school and our research interests. And that's quite important if you're thinking about intercalating, so taking a year out of your medical studies to study another um, degree program, which we'll talk about in a second. So these are just some pictures. That's the medical library. There are textbooks. They're just off outside the uh, shop there. Lots of bookable student study spaces on campus uh, too. So here's a sim man. Uh, so we do a lot of work, particularly in year three of the program, um, where we focus on simulation, so high fidelity simulation uh, out at our clinical education campuses. So this is a sim man. They're brilliant pieces of equipment. We can program them to be very, very lifelike. We can get them to speak. Um, we can perform all sorts of procedures on them. We can take blood from them. You can get interosseous access. You can examine them. It breathes. It has a pulse. Um, has lots and lots of uses in practicing your clinical skills. Okay, so thinking about the structure of the program, we start off in year one with something called essential skills. So you've all come from all sorts of different education systems from across the world. Some of you have studied IB, a lot of you have studied A-level, some of you are mature learners coming back into study, some of you have studied equivalent qualifications overseas. So essential skills is a short block at the start of the program, and that prepares you for what it's like to study at university. We do a couple of test cases to get you through team-based learning, and then we go into two semesters. So there are two semesters um, each year in the first two years of the program. The course is fully semesterized, so you have the normal student holidays around Easter and Christmas and summer um, in years one and two. I'm afraid there are no long holidays in year three, four, and five, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so we go into life cycle and cardiorespiratory fitness. And this is another key difference in our program as compared to some of the ways that medical schools elsewhere structure their curriculum. We don't have a modular structure. So you don't have a block of teaching running on the heart, the lungs, running separately from that, neurology running separately from that, gastrointestinal. The way that our curriculum is structured is that each week you meet a virtual patient and you follow that patient and that pathology, so it's a new pathology or in some cases several different pathologies that you pick up on each week and you follow that patient through their journey. And it's really, really patient-centered curriculum. And the cases are loosely grouped into blocks. Um, so for example, in life cycle, we take you through um, right from um, reproduction, child development, assistive techniques, um, right through um, development growth, right through to aging and senescence and end-of-life care in, um, in cardiorespiratory fitness. So we're following the patient again um, through that journey. 
in cardiorespiratory science, we're doing things like myocardial infarction, heart attack. We're learning about the structure of the cardiovascular system, the blood vessels. We're learning about um, kind of key um, cardiorespiratory conditions. So we'd be looking at um, um, COPD, and we'd be looking at asthma. Um, dare I say it, you'd be looking at COVID, um, um, or the respiratory disease, or the respiratory disease there. Um, and then we have what we call early clinical experience, which is where you have taster placements in hospital and in general practice, right from the start of the program in semester one. Into year two, uh, we cover mind and movement. Again, it's a semester that covers a really broad range of material. Um, so we look at the mind, we look at psychiatric disorders, we look at things like schizophrenia, psychosis, we look at um, major depression, we look at movement disorders like Parkinson's disease. We look at uh, the dementias, like Alzheimer's, for example. And um, we also look at the musculoskeletal system. Then we move on to nutrition and metabolism. Nutrition and metabolism, as you might suggest, takes you through the gastrointestinal tract, takes you through the alimentary system. We look at things like gastric ulcer, stomach ulcer. Um, we look at bowel cancer. Um, we look at the renal system. And um, we look at a bit of endocrinology as well in, uh, in year two. Again, there's more early clinical experience. In year three, you're assigned to your clinical education campus, your base hospital, and you carry out placements. So the placements are structured into blocks of about four weeks in length, and you rotate through a series of these blocks so you see lots of different specialties. But these are the core general medical and general surgical placements. So things like cardiology, respiratory, endocrinology. Okay, rotating through those different specialties. Into year four, um, you've got some of the more specialized stuff. So for example, things like dermatology, neurology. And our students will be able to reel off loads and loads of, uh, loads and loads of others. We've also got the opportunity for a student selected placement. So you might say, well, actually I'm really interested in neurology, or I've done a little bit of dermatology, but not that much and you can select a placement, and you can spend a little bit more time, gives you the opportunity to spend some more time in the specialties that interest you in year four. We also have an elective in year four, so the elective's your opportunity to do something different. Lots of students use it as an opportunity to travel and see healthcare in a different country. Um, some students use it as an opportunity to engage with research, and they do a research elective, or they do an educational elective. Um, they can do it when you can do it abroad. Um, I had a student that was doing a research elective and they were in Wigan, so you know you don't have to travel overseas, but lots of people use it as an opportunity um, to travel and to see something different or to get involved in research, to get involved in education. And as I said, at any point in time, you can take a year out of your medical studies, any time after year two, you can do a bachelor's degree, any time after year three, you can do a master's degree. And I'm gonna ask Nadine to talk a little bit more uh, about that. We also have an integrated PhD program as well that you can, uh, that you can enroll on to, a small number of students. Year five, so I said earlier on that students that are graduates of our program often come back to us and they say that they feel really well prepared for their first jobs as junior doctors. And part of the reason for that is the structure of year five. So by the end of year five, we get a lot of our exams over quite early in your final year of the, uh, of the course so that you can spend some time working with junior doctors, shadowing them. There are obviously things that you can't do, the statutory things like prescribe, for example, but you can be really, really helpful and you can shadow them so that when you hit your first job as an FY1 doctor in August of that uh, year of graduation, you don't feel out of your depth. You feel that you've done it before. Um, you feel that you've been in that environment before and you're really, really well placed uh, to start your first job. We've got a program of personal and professional development that runs alongside this, and we've also got something called PEP. So in, in PPD, you're thinking about, you're reflecting on the encounters that you have with patients. You keep an electronic portfolio of um, some of the things that you've done. Um, it can be really good for building your CV and building up your experience, reflecting on those encounters and thinking about how you can be a better medical student and in the future a doctor. Um, we have uh, something called PEP, which is the Personal Excellence Pathway, and what that does is it means that you engage with research work in every year of the programme. So in year one, um, you're preparing, you're working in a group with other students and an academic supervisor, and you 
prepare a poster presentation as if you were going to a scientific conference or a medical conference. So you start reading the literature. In year two, you do a bit of extended writing. So you write a mini dissertation um, on a topic of your choice. And we're teaching the statistics and we're teaching research methods. We're quite an academic program alongside the core clinical studies. Into year three, you actually carry out your own research project. So you pick a supervisor from within um, the faculty and um, you carry out some original research. For some of you, that might be laboratory-based research. For others, it might be literature projects, it might be educational projects, it might be clinical projects and audit. In year four and year five, that takes on a what we call a quality and evidence focus. And that's all about doing research um, and evaluating outcomes and improving processes um, for patients. So doing things like clinical audit um, in the uh, workplace. And now I've talked about the program for a little while. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk to you a little bit about admissions and how we select <laughs> our students. So commonly we get asked lots of questions um, about how we select students and how we um, use aptitude testing. So obviously we're a UCAT university um, and um, we use the UCAT uh, selection test as part of our entry criteria. There are others and if you're thinking about application for next year rather than this year, um, other universities, most universities in the UK, most medical schools use UCAT. There are a few that use BMAT. There are even fewer that use something called GAMSAT, which is designed for graduates. But UCAT and BMAT, and over 30 universities use the uh, UCAT. So if you're thinking about which groups of universities to apply to, then UCAT is a good aptitude test to take. Um, the UCAT has cognitive domains, and I'll go over this really briefly because I'm aware some of you haven't sat the UCAT and some of you obviously have, and you've got your, um, you've got your results already. It's got some cognitive domains, IQ test-like outcomes, and it's also got a situational judgment test, uh, which gives you a result um, basically from band one through to band four. And I'll talk about the UCAT and how we use that in our selection in the next couple of slides. In terms of work experience, we get lots of questions at the moment, actually, about work experience. So during the pandemic, we're aware that face-to-face -face work experience for most people was suspended. Um, in fact, in the years that uh, preceded the um, pandemic, we were, and most medical schools, actually, and most dental schools, were changing their entry requirements in terms of work experience. Because we are aware that you know, if you know lots of doctors and lots of healthcare professionals, then it can be easier to get that type of work experience. Um, so we, we modified our work experience requirements a few years ago to require some caring work experience, but not necessarily medical shadowing. Okay? So it's all about showing the various different attributes um, uh, that, you, um, that you have, rather than ticking off a box to say you've observed certain things in the clinical environment. Um, so we're already starting to relax those requirements there. And then along came the pandemic and everything went online in terms of work experience. So what I would say is that we now accept both online work experience and face-to-face -face work experience, and we value them equally. Um, it helps when, when people get very, very anxious about work experience. And the, the, the usual question that I get asked is, what sort of work experience is okay? And how much work experience do I need to do? I need to do? The latter one's a really, really common, um, really, really common question. And go back a couple of steps and think, well, actually, why do we ask for work experience in the first place? And the reason that we ask for work experience in the first place is, you tell me. Why do we ask for work experience? Yeah, lady at the back, you have to really shout out. Brilliant, to get a realistic insight into the profession. I like that one. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, so have you got the skills? Have you got the, the characteristics? Have you got the values and behaviors? To, to be a good doctor or a good medical student. Yep, I like both of those. I like both of those answers, okay? So, so really find out if this is the profession for you, if um, being a medical student and working as a doctor is the right profession for you. Um, so hold that in mind when you're thinking about what work experience to do, okay? Um, there are lots of really valuable online um, activities. The Royal College of General Practitioners has a really excellent series of resources, uh, virtual work experience. Um, we don't value virtual work experience any any less than face-to-face -face work experience. Shadowing is nice, it's very useful, um, but really we want you to 
reflect on what you've learned from your work experience. You know, working, often students will work, uh, applicants will work in a, a care home, for example, or they'll do some volunteering, working with vulnerable adults or children. Your work experience can be paid or unpaid. Um, it doesn't, um, doesn't matter. In terms of our academic entry requirements, so our standard offer is three A's at A level. Um, we need either biology or chemistry, plus a second science. Most of our applicants apply with both biology and chemistry. I often get lots of questions about the third subject, um, and um, we don't prefer any specific subjects. I know there are some people here that are just sort of finishing their GCSEs and going on to sixth form and thinking about their A-level choices. I would suggest that you pick a subject that you'll enjoy. Okay, so biology and chemistry are really good choices if you're applying to medical school, because all medical schools have slightly different entry requirements, but most require biology and or chemistry. So it keeps your choices nice and, nice and open if you're taking both biology and chemistry. Your third subject, do something you enjoy and do something you're likely to get an A in. Um, and the two bits of advice that I always give to, give to people. We don't have a list. We don't prefer maths to psychology. We don't prefer, um, you know, sociology to, to English. It really doesn't matter. Do something you enjoy. Do something that you're going to get um, an A in. We do have some English language and maths requirements, so you need a grade six, um, which is a B in old money in terms of your English language and maths GCSEs. Um, we, if you haven't already achieved your A-levels, we need seven GCSE grades, grade seven or above. If your application has a widening participation flag, then we relax some of those criteria around the standard offer. So if you meet certain criteria, and you can check on the university website, largely based on your postcode and the um, academic performance of the school that you attended, um, you can check on the university website whether you're eligible for a contextual offer that reduces those A-level and GCSE grades slightly. If you studied the International Baccalaureate, it's 37.766 at higher level. And obviously, we've talked about the UCAT. You need to sit uh, that UCAT. Personal statement. We don't read it. <laughs> I've called it personal statement here um, and then put underneath it non-academic information form. So we don't read, and most medical schools, there are only a few medical schools that still read the personal statement. Um, if you're sat here and you're thinking, well, I spent loads of time writing that thing, um, and now they're going to, now they're going to ignore it. Um, what we will do, and what most other medical schools will do, is we'll send you a separate form. We send you what we call a non-academic information form. That is effectively a structured personal statement. Um, if you've ever tried writing a personal statement, you'll know that it's really difficult to condense all the information that you need down into such a short amount of, you know, you've got a character limit on that UCAS form. You can cut and paste bits out of the personal statement into the non-academic form. That's absolutely, that's absolutely fine. And the NAIF um, is a structured personal statement that asks these things. So why do you want to be a doctor? Um, and some people have a very cliche motiv motivation. You know, granny was ill when they were six, and ever since then, the medical team were brilliant, and they, they, they saw her care, and um, they thought that uh, this is definitely a career that's for them. Other people, um, they found they were good at science, they also liked working with people, so they came to medicine through a bit of a trial and error, um, a trial and error process. Any motivation is fine. People often worry about having the right answer um, on these forms. There is no right answer. You know, it's your motivation. It's whatever makes you tick as an individual. Same with your experience, which we've largely covered. It can be online, it can be face-to-face, -face, it can be a mixture of the, um, of the two. Doctors work in teams rather than in isolation. So we want you to write an example um, of a time that you've worked as part, of a, as part of a team. Again, we don't have people often think that we have a, a priority list and you know you get hobbies and interests and team working and, and people sometimes think, well, if I play the violin to grade whatever, um, you know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't actually have, we don't, you, don't, you don't get 10 points to captain the rugby team and nine points to play the violin and, and so on and, and so forth. I had a student who was really, really worried a couple of years ago, and they said that what they did was like competitive uh, computer games. And, and he said, well, what if I put this, will you count it against me? The answer is no. We suggested that he get out and enjoy you know, being outside as well, but, um, but it's absolutely fine. In terms of hobbies and interests and motivation, it's what makes you tick as an individual. Um, so don't feel that we, we prefer some activities to others. Um, 
And the key question I won't, I won't ask, well, actually I will, I will ask you, I've got a little bit of time. Um, so hobbies and interests, why do we ask you about your hobbies and interests? Lady at the back, shout out. Yeah, we like to see that you've got interests outside. We want to see that you've got interests outside of medicine, outside of school. Brilliant. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, to see if you can balance those. Yeah, see if you can balance your interests inside and outside of work. Yeah, great. Anything else? Yeah. Transferable skills. You might have learned some things in your hobbies and an interest that you can apply to your studies. Brilliant. Final one. There's a lady up the back there. See how you can contribute to the university as a whole. Brilliant. All, all really good. Um, so interviewers. Um, our interviewers are a mixture of current students, past students, um, academic staff, clinical staff, um, and um, all of those things are absolutely true. Um, and if you, want to, if you want to even take a step back from that, very few people fail to make it through medical school. If you start medical school, actually the, the attrition rates, the dropout rates in medical school are very, very low. So most people that start medical school finish medical school. Um, and we're almost selecting for entry into the medical profession as part of your interview for medical school. So these clinicians who are on the interview panels and in the MMI stations, actually in the back of the mind, they have, well, can I work with this person? Is this person going to be a good colleague in the future? Have they got the transferable skills? Can they manage their work-life balance? But also, are they an interesting, well-rounded human that they're going to be able to work with in the future? So remember that this is almost practically a job interview, as well as being an interview for entry um, to, the, to the university. That's brilliant. You have some really good answers there. Great. So what do we do? You submit your application on the 15th of October. It's a slightly earlier deadline, so you've got two weeks left to, uh, left to go. And then what we'll do is we'll look at your UCAT score. Um, so we will rank you in order um, in terms of, um, in terms of your, your UCAT performance. Um, for entry in 2023, um, we will accept people with bands one to three in the situational judgment test. Um, and we'll operate a UCAT, uh, a UCAT cutoff. For 2024 entry, um, we're planning to um, take applicants in band one and band two of the situational judgment test, and we'll be updating our website. We're also, again, for 2023 entry, we run a holistic assessment. So last year, for example, um, our UCAT cutoff score um, was 2,730, and um, band one, band two uh, for uh, SJT. Um, what we do is we rank our applicants in, in order of UCAT performance and um, we cut off with the number that we have to invite to interview. So we invite about 1,500 people um, to interview. We get about 3,500 applications. So we use UCAT as a filter there um, to get down to a sensible number of, of, of applicants to, to interview. Um, again, for 2023 entry, so the holistic process is changing for 2024 entry and we'll be updating our website, but for 2023 entry, um, we will look at anyone who falls just slightly short of that cutoff score um, and we will look in more detail at the rest of their application. So we'll look at the A-levels that they're studying, we'll look at their GCSE profile, we'll look at whether they have a contextual or widening participation flag um, on their application. And that's a process to ensure um, that we don't just miss good candidates who fall slightly below the standard, uh, the standard cutoff score. We have slightly lower UCAT cut scores for people with contextual flags on their applications um, as well. Our application process and selection process is threshold based, um, so we don't weight elements of the application. So there are some medical schools that will give you a certain number of points for your GCSE performance, certain number of points for your predictor grades, and a certain number of points for your, your, um, your UCAT or, or your BMAT score. Um, we don't do that, it's threshold based, so we look when we receive your application after the 15th of October, um, we will look at your GCSEs, and if your GCSEs meet the minimum requirements, you'll progress to the next stage. Then we'll look at your A-level predictor grades. If you're predicted the offer that you'll eventually be given, then we'll move you on to the next stage. The only time that we look back at those is if you've just narrowly missed the uh, UCAT cut score, and we're looking at you through the holistic route. 
Um, then we'll be inviting people to interview, so we'll send out interview invitations towards the end of November or the first week in December. We are planning at the moment to give people a choice about whether they want to be interviewed online um, or in person, and our interviews will then run um, until the end of February, and then we'll be sending out offers. Um, we do send out offers in batches um, throughout, uh, throughout the year, and we aim to have most of our offer making mid-finished, really, um, by March. I'm thinking about the interview itself, just while we've got a couple of minutes to go. Um, our interview, it's a five-station multiple mini-interview, or MMI, and um, we'll be testing things like your communication skills. We will give you some problems to solve. Um, we will have some simulated patients, so some role play. Um, we'll, we'll have some role play where you have to take on, usually you're playing you, uh, occasionally we'll ask you to play the role of a medical student um, in a hypothetical scenario. Um, we're not looking for amateur dramatics or anything like that, so you don't have to polish your acting skills before you come to, to university. Um, our interview is quite conversational compared to some other medical schools. We don't have maths tests or anything like that. I know there are some medical schools that do um, as, part of the, uh, as part of the interview. One of your interviewers will have a copy of that non-academic information form, so they'll talk to you about your work experience, your interest, your motivation for medicine. We will get you to solve some problems. And to give you an example, it won't, again, it won't be any maths or anything like that that you're asked to, that you're asked to do or any, any puzzles or anything. A good example of a problem-solving scenario um, is one that we used a few years ago. So I'll just give you an example of a couple of these, couple of these stations. We're not using them again, so not giving, any way, giving away any interview questions. But you're on work experience and you're doing work experience in a care home and your task is to plan taking a group of 20 um, older people, who are residents of the, uh, of the care home, on a trip to the seaside. What do you need to do? And then we give you a minute or so to think, and then you have to plan most sorts of things. Um, we also have some contemporaneous medical topics we might want you to do some critical thinking for. Um, so again, examples that we've used in the past are things like assisted dying. So a few years ago, uh, the government was considering um, changing legislation to let people voluntarily, people with, with very, very serious and incurable illnesses, um, to, end, to have, to have the, that choice about whether to end their lives. Um, we also had a, a station where it was talking about the seven-day NHS. So again, at the time, the government was quite keen on ensuring that um, services were available seven days of the week. And what we want you to do in those critical thinking stations, in those uh, situational stations, is to weigh up the different options. So there are some advantages um, to having a NHS services that are open seven days a week, better access, people can go when they're outside work, um, if you're working during the week. Some of the problems associated with that with how you staff um, uh, a uh, sort of seven-day GP service. Um, so you might want to think about, you might want to think about that. Um, and I could go on, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll stop there so we've got plenty of time for, for question and answers. Um, but critical thinking stations, there are, again, there are no right or wrong answers that we're specifically looking for. What we're looking for you to do is to have a really balanced um, opinion. We do want you to conclude. Um, so we, we do want you to have an opinion, but we want you to be able to weigh the pros and cons uh, to any situation that we find you in. Right, I have talked for enough, and we've got a good 20 minutes um, for Q&A with our student ambassadors. Guys, do you want to come up? We've got, we've got two microphones for you here as well. I'll start this off. Um, so hello everyone, um, I'm Nadine. Um, goodness, it was about eight years ago when I was in your position, but um, I've gone through quite a route to university. Um, I did foundation of first year biomed before transferring to medicine, which was at the time something that you could do, but not anymore. Um, I'm a, I've done three years of medicine, and currently integrating my PhD, um, nearly there, third year, but I'll let everyone introduce. Hi, I'm Helen, and I'm currently in fifth year. I have intercalated as well, but not in a PhD. Hi, I'm Samiti. I'm just a second year student. Hi, everyone. I'm Janice. I'm in my fifth year. I haven't intercalated. 
Brilliant. So we've got a full range, full range of people. So I have a microphone. Um, if you have any questions, either for me in terms of admissions or entry requirements, or our students in terms of what they've done, their own journey, the things they did as part of their application, or anything you want to throw at them or me, stick up your hand and I'll come around. Yeah, there we go. Right. I'll go with the lady here and then, and then there. Okay, what's your question? Um, could you talk a bit more about the benefits of intercalating? Um, so, for me personally, it was more that I got to delve into the academic side of uh, medicine. I think that throughout the medical course, to be fair, the personal excellence program is a fantastic opportunity to see if research was something that you wanted within your career as well, um, alongside doing medicine. And from that, it inspired me to go further and actually intercalate. So, intercalating um, helps because, A, you get the opportunity to work with, you know, leading scientists in the field. Um, you're able to work on a research project depending on if you do a master's or a bachelor's or an MRes, which is a master's of research. The MRes is the more research dominant side to it. But it helps you um, actually get an experience in the field of interest that you have. So it could be a medical one or it could be in law. Um, you can intercalate in law um, and do it that way instead. Um, most intercalations happen within Manchester. But if there isn't one that is available in Manchester um, of your uh, interest, then you can try and intercalate outside of Manchester as well. But it helps you build transferable skills, I think, that have really helped you as an academic, but also um, as a medic in the future as well. Um, and it's a lot of experience. Um, I think another thing for me was that medicine is a long course. It's five years. It's five years straight of medicine. Um, so taking a year out to do something else that I found interesting actually kind of helped in the long run. Um, so yeah, I did an MSc uh, in neuroimaging, which I've always found interesting. Like at school, I like physics side of things, which is less involved in medicine, but it meant I got to get into the imaging side of it. Um, so yeah, it's kind of exploring other interests that you have as well. Brilliant. Thanks, guys. There was a question. Was it somewhere down there? If you want to just oh, just sh you can shout if you like. How much stuff do you want in the non-academic non information form? How much, how much do we want in the non-academic information form? Um, there's a character limit. Oh, feel free to sit down. You don't have to stand, you don't have to stand up. Um, the um, non-academic information, I would suggest that you use the character limit that you've got available. Um, most, most people write up to the characters. You need about 1,000 characters or, or, or so for the sections. Um, so there's use, use the, uh, the space that you've, yeah, definitely use the space that you've got. Brilliant. Anything else, lady? That um, this one's for Dr. Tommy mainly. But um, <laughs> uh, you know how you said there was 2023 holistic admissions. Mm -hmm. How's that changing for 2024? Because you mentioned that briefly. Yeah. Um, so for 2024, um, we're removing the holistic selection route as as is, and it's going to become a route that focuses much more on widening participation. Um, so part of the contextual offer. Uh, making that we that we perform, but we'll update the website to tell you a little bit more about that. Great. I'll come back to you. There you go. Um, what made you personally pick Manchester over other universities? I mean, okay, we'll get down the line on this one. Um, for me, Manchester, it's a such a friendly place. Um, that's one thing. Why Manchester for medicine? Because full body dissections, it's a very hands-on um, university. It really focuses on patient care, but also like the holistic approach to patient care. It helps focus on you as a student and supporting you with these, you know, the actors that come in and you can practice on them, examinations, etc. So it supports you as a as an individual and as a student that's eventually going to become a doctor, but also focuses on the patient and making them at ease. And academically, it's very strong. Um, but for me, it was all the hands-on approach from first year onwards in going to hospitals or even the anatomy as well. Um, for me, when they gave me an offer, so I, <laughs> um, I actually strangely enjoyed my interview for Manchester compared to some of the other ones I did. Um, it was a lot more friendly than some of the other ones that I did, which I think probably helped. And sort of since I've been on the course, the thing I've sort of learned to 
kind of appreciate more is the pastoral support they have, mainly because it's not just based at the university. So once you actually start your clinical years, each of the base hospitals has its own pastoral support team as well. So you don't have to, if you do need them, you're not going to and from uni all the time. It, it's where you are. So there's always people available to help. Um, I mean, I mostly chose it because, like, yeah, it's very patient-centered. We like the PBL approach because, obviously, I'm in, like, in still in second year. So when we do the cases, it's very, very patient-centered. You look at everything in context of that patient because, for me, like, I really enjoy the science part of medicine, but, like, Manchester's kind of helped me appreciate the fact that it's, like, a lot more around, like, a human being. And also the fact that, yeah, full-body dissections, they're, they're a lot of fun. Like, interactive stuff is, yeah, great. Yeah, so I feel like most things have been mentioned uh, by now, but one thing that did also kind of cross my mind when I was considering was the location as well. Uh, I think Manchester is quite a nice city. I could really picture myself living here for five years. Um, I think it's very affordable as a student. You can do quite a lot of things, have a pretty good life. Um, and it's quite big as well, so that was, that was also in the mix as well. Brilliant. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that. So we do have quite a friendly interview process in comparison with a lot of other medical schools. It always surprises me that. So the, you know, the interview, you should enjoy the interview. It's, you've, got, you've got five people who are focusing their time on you in that interview station. You know, you've got, you probably have a few doctors, you'll have a few medical students, you'll have a few members of academic staff, and they're all interested in you and why you're embarking on this journey. So enjoy it. And it, it's, it's, uh, well, you will be terrified, of course you will. Um, you, you will be anxious, um, but you know, it's, it's not something to become incredibly worried about. It's actually quite a nice, relaxed interview process. There was a question over here. Just pass us that down, if you will. Do you accept 17-year-olds to yes. the course? Yes. That was an easy one. <laughs> yes, we do. Uh, question there as well? That's an easy one. Just a quick one. Do you have a lot of um, people deferred from last year coming onto the course this no. year? No. Um, so in terms of deferrals, um, we never had a... So in, in the first year of COVID, we had a number of deferrals that were carried through. About 35, en it ended up. 33, 35 ended up deferring. Um, in the sort of... The, the, this last year that we just recruited to, we had the normal number of deferrals. So ev every year you will have people deferring, people apply for deferred entry, people get their offer and then ask to defer, and then a roughly equal number undefer from the previous year. So you've always got some, I would say it's, it's sort of, it's under 10 people that are deferring in each, in each year. So we're back, to, we're back to normal. I know a lot of people are worried about that because all my counterparts at other medical schools are, um, are being asked that question too. Um, most medical schools are now over that peak of COVID-related deferral. So we're, we're pretty much back down, to, back down to normal. Great. Any other questions, ladies and gents? So we'll come back up here then. There you go. How have you found the workload? Um, so the workload is very variable. Um, it's obviously, I, I presume everyone here has an understanding as to what medical school would entail, which is that it's not um, the easiest journey, but it is quite a rewarding journey. Uh, as you progress through the years, the workload does become slightly larger, I'd say, but it also becomes much more manageable because you do adjust and learn how to learn how to learn essentially in medical school um, but I would say even up until now in my final year I do find time to do things outside of um, clinical medicine and spend some time with friends or extracurricular hobbies uh, don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in the one thing I found with the workload was that it wasn't necessarily the workload that I struggled with it was more the change from like six I came from sixth form so it was the change from learning in sixth form where you've got teachers going, have you done this, have you done this, have you done this, to coming to uni where it's more, it's you sort of doing it for yourself. It isn't just a medicine problem though either, so that's, that's every first year is in the exact same boat. So that was kind of the, the workload itself is manageable, it's how you deal with it yourself. That's a really good point. Yeah, no, I found that like if you prioritise doing things outside of uni as well, you, you do manage it. Like, you will have some downtime and you can join, like, societies and go to events and there's all sorts of stuff going on, but yeah. I think people find it really easy to 
engage with societies and sports and things like that in years one and two. Um, you, you, our third, fourth, and fifth years still, still do have very active social lives. Um, but as you go into years three, four, and five, medicine and study becomes more of a full-time job. Um, and, and basically, by, by year five, you're, you're almost working full-time um, in your, your clinical placement. So it takes a bit of prioritizing to do, but our students manage it manage it really well. There was another question around here, yep. I guess this is kind of similar to the previous question, but have the demands of studying medicine made it more difficult to maintain friendships? Um, well, I haven't found that in that case because I find like you'll, you'll have like friends you, you will do medicine with in the sense that like you'll meet people on your course and you, they find it relatable in that sense. Obviously, we're all busy, but we'll find time for each other, type thing. And even then, like I managed to find friends like off my course, and in that sense, it's been like meeting people through other channels. So it does it does work you, if you can manage it. But um, yeah, that's just like the first and second year thing. Um, so for me, I've never actually lived with medics at all, um, not avoidance or anything, but. Basically, the thing I found was like, like Drew said, because it becomes more like a full-time job the further you get on. When your friends have graduated and are doing jobs themselves, you kind of, you kind of understand it. You kind of go through the same thing at the same time. Just you're still a student technically. So, like for me, I'm on the wards pretty much five days a week now. So I've got friends who are in normal full-time jobs, and it actually, it's actually easier to see them now than it was when we were both students. But I think one thing as well is like I have friends from back home and where I mean I live at home as well as go to university um, but one thing that you realize you'll also make university friends as well and so people at university may be a bit more understanding in terms of what your schedule's like or how busy you can be as opposed to people that may not have necessarily gone through university which is what the mix I had um, generally speaking uh, it's encouraged that you try and maintain time away away from studying and have that balance in your life so going out with friends and socializing my word of advice is don't just stick to medic friends or medic societies you know go for non-medical societies and make non-medical friends as well when it comes to your exam time and everyone's super stressed and you just want somebody to speak to that you can just not talk about work sometimes it's helpful to like see your non-medic friends and maybe that would be your way of clicking off and you're not tempted to talk about your next course, which nobody will understand if they don't do medicine. So I think it's just making sure you prioritise that time. It's like golden time in all our lives. It's like when we're a doctor as well, we will depend on that time because it helps drive you and it motivates you to work more. So it's, it's a productive way of doing it. Great. Probably got time for a couple more questions. I've got one here. Anyone at the back over there? Yeah, brilliant. There you are. Um, okay. um, I just wanted to ask, how was your placement year and like how did you cope throughout that process? And like what is your placement year like basically? Um, so you're thinking, so you're placed in all years of the course. Um, so you have clinical placements in all years of the course. Um, years three, four and five are, are, are entirely placement with obviously some teaching around that. Um, and years one and two, you've got taste of placements within the, within the core years. Is it, so what's it like? Like your first first clinical placement, yeah. What, what's your experience of your first clinical placement? What was it like? Interesting. I would definitely say that word. Um, I mean, part of me is like, I'm new to the whole medical field, so like I have no one in my family that's a medic or things like that. So the language or just delving into the environment was new and it was exciting, to be honest. That's the approach I took of it. Um, I found it to be, because we go to teaching hospitals, whether it's with Insure, I mean, I'm at Insure, but all the teaching hospitals are designed in a way that you can actually go and do your placement and then you can go to debrief and reflect and actually say how you honestly feel and if there's anything you want to talk about. So I found it supportive. I loved speaking to patients. That was my favourite bit. Um, and I think that it starts to help you envisage who you're going to be as a doctor and like you actually in the role. So it's motivating. Well, it was for me anyway. It, there were times where I was like, oh, I'm, I'm, I, I want to do more. I'm not good enough. I need to learn more. But that just drives you to work. And you have support there if you feel that way as well. Um, I still remember my first day on placement uh, in first year. I went to Salford. Um, it's strange because they do just, you kind of start from the very, very start. So like, I remember the first hour for us was how to wash your hands properly. 
So it starts right at the basics. Um, and then we got sent onto the wards. They kind of showed you around the wards and how wards actually work. Because obviously you do a lot of the sort of theoretical side of it, but you forget about the, there's obviously nursing staff, healthcare staff, all the other staff that are on the wards as well. Um, so you kind of get introduced to them and sort of start from there. And then when you go and see patients, it is quite a shock the first time you actually go and speak to someone who is quite ill. Because um, so obviously at university, we, yes, we use simulator patients who are really good at, at acting ill. But obviously seeing someone who's on a lot of drips and things like that is it's still very different and it can be quite difficult to maintain everything right at the very start. So like Nadine said, it's really good because then once you've sort of done that part of it, there is a big debrief kind of session at the end where you can sort of talk through what you've seen, what shocked you, what didn't, and that sort of thing. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm going to try and squeeze in two more questions. So let's go with one here. Um, uh, it's just about the UCAT. Do you, do you know how much you think it will deviate from last year's threshold? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, it's one we've been asked a lot today. <laughs> um, so as you probably know, all medical schools made fewer offers last year. Um, the general expectation amongst um, medical schools council members is that um, we will make more offers in the, uh, would be subject to some government guidance potentially, but we will be making slightly more offers than we made, than we made this year. So we'll, over the next two or three years, we'll be um, increasing the number of offers until we're at roughly pre-pandemic levels, we, we suspect. So I actually think that the UCAT, so our cutoff was 2730 last year, Assuming that we have a similar number of applicants, um, about three and a half thousand, um, then the UCAT score will probably drop very slightly. Um, obviously, if we get another thousand applicants, if we convince lots of you to apply, um, then the UCAT score will go up. Um, but roughly, so last year, I, I know if you, you can look at our data page as well. So if you, if you Google Manchester Medicine data, you can see all of our historic UCAT thresholds um, there, as, there as well. So I suspect it will change a little. Yeah. Great. Thank you. How many students do you interview each year and how many students do you take in? Yep, so we take in um, 397 students, um, 397 students from our CAPT intake. Um, we also take additional groups of students in as well at certain points. So, for example, about 80 students join us from St Andrews University in, in year three, and we've got some commission programmes, but 397 um, is the number of places that we have available um, to, um, to, to start a number of, number of capped places. Interviews, um, we interview about 1,500. Um, so that, that number's coming down a little bit. It used to be about 1,800. We expect it to be about 1,400, 1,500. Um, and then again, the number of offers, you can have a look at our website. We're just about to finalise updating our website. Um, Pre-COVID, we made about 900 to 1,000 offers. Um, when we interviewed about 1,800 students, um, that has dropped from so from from that high um, to about 700 odd offers, and then down last year to about 550 offers um, from about 1,400 interviews. We are expecting that to go back up again um, to make more than about 550 offers. So I, I suspect it depends on the behaviour of the other medical schools and the applicants, but I, I suspect it will be over 700 offers that are made that are that are made this year. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And thank you very much to our, to our students. So the, the only words that I'll leave you with are visit as many medical schools as you can. Some of them will feel right. Those are the ones to apply to. Good luck. Contact us if you have any questions. Thank you.